Okay, thank you. Um, well, you've already been looking at the title for a little while, so I guess we can go to the second slide, Anya. So I'm going to be actually be introducing uh, introducing this and then uh, turning it over to uh, Anya to take over uh, uh, probably in about five or ten minutes. But at least I thought I would uh, contribute by uh, giving a bit of an introduction. Uh, but before Anya and I get started, I'd like to acknowledge. Uh, the contribution to this project uh, by uh, Manisha Pawa, uh, who is a PhD student uh, at the uh, uh, McMaster University here in Ontario and also works with the Occupational Cancer Research Center. And Soham, uh, oh God, Perelker, uh, hopefully I butchered his name, I'm not used to saying his last name, who is now with the uh, Provincial Health Services Authority in, uh, in BC, but uh, prior to that was, uh, had recently completed his uh, master's at UBC. I'd also want to thank our advisory panel uh, for this, uh, and you see them listed here. Um, uh, at least one of these folks you, uh, uh, you, you may know, um, uh, John Beckett, who is actually, I believe, still a, um, um, an ad adjunct faculty member with, uh, with UBC. So um, let's see, I'm just gonna admit a few more people here who are in the waiting room. I wanted to say a few things initially about the Canadian Standards Association. I think a lot of people uh, certainly uh, hear, the, hear the name of the Canadian Standards Association, which now goes by the Canadian Standard or the CSA group, I guess it's kind of like TD Bank. Uh, they, uh, they don't use the uh, spell it out uh, for what the CSA stands for. Um, they are an independent not-for-profit membership association and really one of the uh, uh, leaders uh, internationally in developing standards. Uh, so not just uh, Canada, but certainly many Americans are familiar with CSA also as a standards uh, organization and uh, other countries as well. It has... Uh, a really large number of committees, around 1,300 committees focused on standards development and has uh, developed and maintained over 3,000 codes and standards, um, uh, many of which have been referenced in legislation. So we'll, we'll get back uh, to that in a few minutes, but um, just thought it'd be helpful to, to be reminded what CSA actually is. Can we go to the next slide, Anya? Anya, could I have the next slide, please? Anya, the oh, the next slide, please. You've got it. Oh, I do have it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was looking in the wrong place. Okay, sorry, everybody. So what you see here is um, uh, some results from a project that uh, our center in Toronto did with. Uh, Chris McLeod and Lil Tamburch from, uh, from UBC, looking at uh, trends in mesothelioma incidence in uh, both Ontario and BC. And what you, what you see here, which I think is an important thing, is that uh, we have now kind of somewhat leveled off in our, our rates, at least in these two provinces and probably in some other provinces within Canada, uh, of mesothelioma. The numbers continue to go up. Uh, but not, uh, uh, but not the uh, uh, the rates at least uh, in these places. Uh, they leveled off a little earlier in um, in uh, BC rather than uh, Toronto. But it's important to point out that they still seem to be gradually rising in women. And I think what we're seeing here primarily is, uh, or possibly, is a bit of a transition from uh, workplace exposure really driving. Uh, the mesothelial rates to a uh, shift towards uh, towards environmental uh, exposure and more widespread exposure in society. But uh, uh, certainly, despite the ban, we're going to be continuing on with our um, uh, with having uh, people in uh, getting developing mesothelium over time. I'm sorry. Can I have the next slide, please? So recently. Um, uh, the uh, 
uh, Carex Canada actually updated its estimates of the numbers of people exposed to asbestos in Canada. Uh, until recently, that estimate was around 150,000. Uh, now it's 235,000. Part of that was really recognizing uh, the exposure that people are getting uh, from uh, basically uh, um, either cleaning or maintaining uh, our buildings uh, that have asbestos in them. Uh, almost any school that was built, for instance, uh, prior to 1980, and some of those built afterwards, may have substantial amounts of asbestos in it. Uh, and we're actually seeing cases of asbestos-related disease uh, arising from those. So um, this may not be uh, truly all the people who are ever exposed to asbestos, but where uh, the uh, number has been expanded to recognizing uh, that the, that this is uh, this is the case. I have the next slide, please. And a lot of that is still arising among the construction trades, but uh, you see here that it's in a, a mix of other sectors uh, as well. Many of these exposures are low, uh, but again, uh, for things like mesothelioma, if you expose enough people even to low levels of asbestos, you're going to get uh, cases. So uh, mesothelioma is a good indicator of how widespread uh, exposure to asbestos uh, is and probably will continue to be for some time. Uh, next slide, please. Now, um, just to set the context uh, for this, uh, you know, regulations in Canada are created by uh, uh, by government. Um, and uh, in the case of occupational, they're primarily carried out or, you know, actually uh, created by our ministries of labor or similar agencies. So for instance, in British Columbia, uh, uh, WorkSafe BC has a responsibility for prevention as well uh, as compensation. Uh, but uh, standards also play a very important role. Uh, but they are not regulations until they are adopted as uh, um, uh, as regulations. So what you'll see is the standards will be developed uh, and they'll be in place. Uh, but until until they're actually adopted as regulations, all they really have is the strength of being a guideline. I'll go to the next slide, please. So uh, the purpose of the project we're about to describe was basically uh, to do some of the background research uh, for CSA uh, regarding the need or the potential need for uh, an asbestos management standard here in Canada. Um, uh, we've, already, we've already identified the team that worked on it and our, our advisory group. Um, the methods that we use for this are pretty straightforward. Uh, basically we did, uh, a scan for published literature uh, uh, in a number of different databases. We tried to do an environmental scan to identify regulations uh, in the different jurisdictions within Canada and in uh, key international jurisdictions for comparison. Uh, we also did, or I'm saying we in the royal sense, uh, um, but uh, also there were 31 uh, stakeholder interviews, kind of key informants uh, from across Canada that were interviewed uh, to, to uh, uh, see what their views were on the need for a standard and the effectiveness of current regulations. Um, and then uh, basically what we did was do a gap analysis and develop a series of recommendations. And if you read the report, which is um, online through CSA, and I think we'll give you a link towards the end of this uh, presentation, you'll see that there are uh, 23 tables in it, I believe, uh, that uh, summarize and compare key regulatory requirements across uh, 14 uh, different Canadian jurisdictions. We'll go to the next slide, please. Now, asbestos management is really, uh, um, I believe, a kind of a complex uh, uh, process. It starts with the identification of uh, um, the location and the condition of asbestos, uh, goes through assessing the risk from exposure to asbestos, uh, that is the likelihood that that asbestos will become airborne, uh, 
um, uh, and the severity of the risk that's there uh, to selecting uh, the proper controls to be in place uh, and then through to the the evaluation of the effectiveness of those controls. So we really considered a, a broad range of different things in looking at this really um, uh, all the way through to uh, disposal of asbestos after it's been uh, removed. Uh, so it was a pretty, we tried to take a pretty comprehensive look at the different regulations that are uh, governing uh, this. Um, but we should say that the overall success of asbestos management uh, processes depends on uh, really anybody who, work, who works with asbestos or is exposed to asbestos uh, needs to be appropriately trained uh, and possess the necessary competencies uh, to, uh, to be able to work with that safely. Um, and we need a very strong regulatory framework uh, in the context of asbestos. That includes everything from bans, limits on levels of exposure, uh, and prescription or performance-based guidelines for safe use. I'll go to the next uh, next slide. Um, so we've identified here um, a number of key gaps and challenges, and you see them listed here. And this is what uh, um, Anya will be going through uh, in just a few moments. Uh, going through these uh, these different um, the different gaps and challenges that we identified, and really giving a high high level summary of what we've seen. Um, and uh, I don't think I um, need to repeat them or say them out loud here. Uh, but you'll you'll we'll be going through all seven of these over the course of this uh, presentation. And let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, so we're going to start off with our first uh, skill level test, um, uh, or whatever we call this poll, I guess. Uh, how many individual pieces of legislation impact asbestos management in Canada is the question. And what you see here is the map of all the different jurisdictions, or at least the major jurisdictions. Okay, about three quarter of the people have uh, responded. Anya, do you want to take over at this point? You're, you're muted, Anya. Or maybe you want to be muted, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Pratik. Uh, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, yeah. Great. So um, thanks, everybody, for um, participating in that poll. Um, I will say that uh, the least number, well, not quite the least number of answers, but um, those of you who selected more than 50 um, were right. And I will uh, go on to show you. Can you um, close the results? It's actually, oh, I see. Can I close it from? Oh, perfect. Thanks. Um, so what I'm going to give you the number in a second. Um, so uh, as Paul um, laid out, there were seven key gaps and challenges that we identified uh, in this process. Um, the first one being multiple legislative and regulatory frameworks. And um, what I've set out here on the slide are the areas of the, um, the three major areas. And then there's kind of a fourth, which is kind of a catch all other category. So um, we study uh, regulations that govern how asbestos is managed in, in this country. Uh, in the Occupational Health and Safety Framework, we see it in the Environmental Framework, and we see it in the Public Health Framework, as well as this kind of catch all of other. So this is how many pieces of legislation that we uh, found when we did our scan. So in total, there were 71 pieces of legislation uh, currently in or kind of in the middle of last year um, that had 
the language in them that governed how asbestos gets to be controlled or managed um, in the workplace, in the community, um, or sort of in the environment at large. Um, what we did find when we started to look at those pieces of legislation and we kind of compared um, the information was that those instruments are broadly consistent in the outcomes that they're trying to achieve, but the, the division of responsibility that um, we see from across these different frameworks um, has led to different approaches in how asbestos is managed kind of in practical terms. Um, what we heard from the key informants, and Paul mentioned that we did speak to 31 key informants. Um, what we heard from the key informants is that this siloing of uh, regulatory responsibility and this kind of multiple frameworks um, creates some huge challenges for people who are working in asbestos management. Um, they, if they're working in multiple jurisdictions, they've got uh, different frameworks that they have to comply with. And it's also creating some challenges for regulators as well. So within a jurisdiction, if you've got multiple, you know, you've got a health and safety and an environmental and municipal frameworks, it's creating difficulties, you know, across those frameworks for, for the regulators as well. So for the purposes of the presentation, what I am going to focus on is um, the occupational health and safety framework. Although I will touch at a couple of points on what we learned when we looked at the, the regulations. Uh, sorry, the environmental legislation. So when we did the lit review and the great, uh, both the gray and the peer, uh, peer reviewed lit review, and also um, undertook the key informant interviews, um, we identified that there are two necessary requirements for accurate identification um, of asbestos and um, asbestos containing materials, which throughout this presentation, uh, I get, in places I have um, uh, abbreviated it as ACM. So the first is a clear and consistent definition, and the second is reliable and validated methods for both sampling and analysis. So what you see on this slide are the different ways uh, and the terms that are used to, de to define asbestos. Um, I just want to kind of orient you to, the, to this slide as well as others. So what but the information that's in the brackets where I talk about jurisdictions, that, that refers to the number of jurisdictions in which we found these requirements. Um, and then at the bottom of most of these slides, I've made the note that there are 14 jurisdictions, so 14 provinces and territories plus the federal um, jurisdiction, and that they reflect the regulations that were in effect at the time of the scan. So the scan was performed in June and July of last year. There have been some updates to some of these regulations. Um, most notably, the Yukon has just introduced um, and tabled new legislation to update their um, Occupational Health and Safety Act and the regulations to bring it up to date from 1986. So the, the numbers uh, reflecting the Yukon uh, may, may in fact be a, a little bit different than they were last year. So um, what, what if we wanted to convey with this slide was that you can see first there are different terms that are used to uh, that are used and also defined in relation to asbestos, um, and that there is some variation across the country. So asbestos, the term itself, um, is defined in the context of the fibrous form of the mineral. Um, asbestos containing material, almost all jurisdictions in Canada with the exception last year of the Yukon, and it may now be included in their, their regulations, define asbestos containing material as containing some minimum percentage of asbestos. And that ranges from 0.1% to 1%. And uh, in some cases, it's defined on the basis of volume, and in other cases, most cases on the basis of weight. Um, some jurisdictions also um, define vermiculite as a separate category and others included in kind of the broader category. Um, I'm not gonna touch too much on asbestos dust or friability other, to, other than to note um, in, the, in the context of uh, the definitions related to friable is that these are the terms that are used and they're not used consistently. So they're used in different combinations. So some jurisdictions will say it's crumbled and pulverized. Some will say it's crumbled and powdered. Some will say crumbled, pulverized when dry and you know, kind of polarized by hand pressure. So there's different kind of permutations of those terms that are used. So the takeaway here is that there is inconsistency across the country. So 
moving on to um, how uh, the risk of exposure is determined, um, what we found was that the rules for how the hazard is identified, um, also how it's documented, and how risk is assessed varies across the country. So some jurisdictions have very explicit guidelines within their regulatory framework around how the hazard is to be identified. Um, some are very specific. Most of them are very specific about the testing requirements, but the specific testing method that's to be used varies. So it's not the same across the country. Um, some specify method and others say things like appropriate methods or approved methods, but they, they're not very prescriptive. In terms of um, requirements around asbestos inventories, um, we found that the majority of the jurisdictions in this country do have a requirement for um, asbestos inventories. But as you can see from the numbers of jurisdictions uh, related, you know, kind of that are mapped onto these factors, um, it varies. So again, it's not consistent across the country. Um, in terms of risk assessment, um, what we found was that there are requirements built into the regulations. Those requirements, most of the time, are very explicit that the risk um, to asbestos or to asbestos um, containing materials, that it must be assessed by a competent or qualified person. And we're going to touch more on competence and qualifications in a few minutes. Um, but as you can see, that um, the, the, the factors that go into the risk assessment are also different across the country. So not all jurisdictions um, are, are prescribing uh, location type of ACM condition, those kinds of those factors be considered. Uh, about three quarters of the, of the jurisdictions in Canada um, have built into their regulations um, predetermined, what we refer to as predetermined classes of risk. So they have categorized certain activities or workplaces as being low, moderate, or high risk. But what I wanted to show you is, and share with you, is an example of how that looks. So what you see on this slide are three examples of how high-risk activity is defined in this country. So at the federal level, the, um, the legislation that applies to federal workplaces, there is a very detailed and very prescriptive definition of what a high-risk activity is. In contrast, um, British Columbia, it's more performance-based. Um, so it's, the, it's defined as an activity that involves working with or in proximity to asbestos-containing material if a high level of control is necessary. And then there, some of that is expanded upon in guidelines or uh, other interpretive um, documents. What we heard from the key informants in this regard was that they, they expressed some concern with the, this variation in, um, in how uh, risk is categorized. Um, one, in part because uh, this categorization of risk is an almost entirely based on abatement or asbestos removal. And they also express concern with lack of agreement. So if they're working in multiple jurisdictions, what constitutes uh, a high-risk activity isn't necessarily the same as what constitutes a high-risk activity in a different uh, environment. So I want to briefly touch on um, the what we learned about the measures that are required across the country to protect workers from exposure. Um, what we found was that most, but not all, um, jurisdictions in Canada um, set out prohibitions in their regulations about the use of certain types of asbestos. Um, and you can see here we flagged um, the, the two prohibitions are in relation to the use of crucidolite or the spraying of asbestos or asbestos-containing material. Now, what this doesn't uh, take into account, and Paul alluded to this in the introduction, is that in 2018, the federal government introduced a ban on asbestos and the use of asbestos in certain, um, for, you know, under certain conditions. So these prohibitions that we see in current occupational health and safety regulations across the country um, don't reflect that ban. Um, in terms of the hierarchy or the kind of the measures that are, are required or recommended to control exposure, what you can see here is that the majority of jurisdictions in the country um, have either explicitly or implicitly referred to the hierarchy of controls um, in terms of, of the requirements for how um, uh, asbestos 
exposures to be controlled. Um, with the majority, uh, all, uh, sorry, all jurisdictions requiring administrative controls, almost all requiring engineering controls, and then sort of variation in terms of you know, whether it needs to be eliminated or isolation. Um, and then also all jurisdictions requiring personal protective equipment. So we're going to jump to the second poll before I share with you uh, what we learned about the exposure standards across the country. So the second poll question is, do occupational exposure limits for asbestos vary by province? And your options are no, the OELs that are set in Canada protect all workers equally, uh, B, yes, but only for chrysotile, and C, yes, the OELs vary across, across Canada by up to an order of magnitude. You guys got it. Yes, the uh, OELs vary across the country and in some cases by up to an order of magnitude. So I'm just going to shut this pop up menu on my screen and share with you um, what the standards look like and how they compare uh, across the country. Sorry, the poll just popped back up on my screen. So just to orient you to the table. Um, what I have set up here are the um, exposure standards that existed in Canada as of the middle of last year. Um, so down the left-hand column, you see the list of jurisdictions. Uh, the two middle columns are the occupational exposure standards. So there's an eight-hour time weight uh, average that we've listed as well as a 15-minute short-term exposure limit. And then on the far column is the uh, clearance exposure limits. Um, so what you can see is that um, all uh, jurisdictions have adopted an exposure limit under their regulations. Um, but, and actually what I wanted to just sort of uh, highlight here is that what wasn't um, explicitly apparent to us in looking at the tables for Saskatchewan, the Northwest Territories and Nunavut was an explicit uh, OEL for asbestos. Even though they do have tables of contamination limits, there was nothing specific to asbestos there. The majority of jurisdictions in Canada have adopted um, 0.1 uh, fibers per cc as their exposure limit. Um, but you can see that as of last year, there were two jurisdictions in Canada that had um, exposure limits that were quite a bit higher than um, what was adopted elsewhere in the country, uh, as well as um, some interesting and an interesting approach to it. Uh, you can see that they had fiber specific exposure limits um, and that uh, they range um, by, uh, uh, from 0.2 to 1. So there's a five fold difference in the exposure limits that were adopted in both Quebec and in the Yukon. Um, when you look at the uh, clearance limits, um, most jurisdictions in Canada have adopted 0.01 fibers per cc. And what we're referring to with clearance um, limits or clearance sampling is the level that must be met um, in an abatement or removal process, like when you're breaking down the, um, the removal shelter, you have to ensure that the, um, the amount of exposure uh, that you're measuring or the amount of asbestos that you're measuring meets, is, meets or is below that, that limit. Um, but what you can see here is that there is a, some variation. The majority have adopted 0.01 but at the federal level and BC and in New Brunswick, as well as uh, in Yukon uh, as of last year, um, that they were higher than, than that level. So moving on. So one of, the, I mean, everybody in this room and everyone online is aware that um, uh, you know, the Occupational Health and Safety Regulations and the regulatory framework um, require, you know, if there are exposure limits, there is a requirement that employers must control that exposure below any applicable exposure limits. Um, what we discovered was that even though there is this expectation that exposure would be 
um, controlled below that exposure limit, that not all jurisdictions have explicit requirements around monitoring and measurement of exposure. So what this slide uh, captures is some information around uh, what we learned about um, the exposure monitoring requirements. So um, what we found was, again, that there is variation across the country. So um, personal samples are required or explicitly required by three quarters of the jurisdictions almost all required area samples, although the conditions that trigger the need for area sampling varied by province, um, and as well as the, the frequency um, and kind of the location of, of where those samples should be collected. Um, the rules and regulations are inconsistent across the country um, regarding whether the monitoring of exposure as well as the analysis of exposure um, or the analysis of those, of those samples must be performed by competent or qualified personnel. So we have issues now, you sort of see a little bit of a theme emerging. So we saw kind of in that hazard identification piece, as well as we're seeing it here around um, monitoring, that there's not consistency around um, uh, that kind of competency and uh, kind of what determines competency and qualifications. Um, we also noted that not all jurisdictions are um, explicitly stating what their sampling and analysis or required sampling and analysis methods are and that there is some differences across the country in terms of the methods that are required. So we're going to jump to the third poll before we uh, talk about what we learned about health monitoring. So um, the third poll is what proportion of jurisdictions in Canada require health monitoring of exposed workers? Um, and your choices are less than half, half to two thirds, more than two thirds, or D, all jurisdictions in Canada require health monitoring. More people chose less than half, followed by all jurisdictions, followed by half to two thirds, and uh, finally um, more than two thirds. Um, in fact, what we found when we looked at this so, not all jurisdictions require health monitoring, but approximately three quarters of them do. Um, and those that do uh, require that the cost of health monitoring be borne by the employer. Um, what we did find, though, and this seems to be, uh, this is kind of the recurring pattern of this um, and recurring theme of this presentation, is that there are differences and that there are gaps. Um, so what we um, found was that there um, were differences in terms of the data that were to be collected and the frequency of assessment. Um, so differences across the country. Um, of those that did require health monitoring, most but not all required pulmonary function tests. Some were very explicit about what those tests were, others just said pulmonary function tests. Approximately half required um, chest x-rays um, at defined intervals, but the defined intervals that were um, specified uh, were different across the country. Um, and then approximately half of the jurisdictions uh, require documentation of both occupational as well as non-occupational exposures. Um, there were differences in terms of the requirements for baseline assessments, um, in terms of the, whether or not um, periodic reassessment was required, as well as the frequency of, of that um, reassessment. Um, so for example, what we were seeing was um, that the frequency of assessment ranged from once a year to uh, once every five years. Um, the, most of the, of the jurisdictions who did require periodic um, uh, reassessment sort of coming in around the two year um, point. Um, two jurisdictions in Canada required um, that health monitoring or a health assessment be done after an acute, a, a kind of a, a point of 
acute exposure, but that wasn't common. Um, and in some cases, that frequency of what determined the frequency of reassessment, whether it was one year, two years, three years, or five years, um, depended on, on the duration and extent of exposure. So some regulations kind of provide some prescriptive um, you know, information around like what, uh, how long someone had to be exposed um, and the extent of their exposure. So I'm just, I'm conscious of time um, and I've got, I think, three more slides I just want to quickly touch on before I wrap up. Um, competency and training, this has been an, an issue, sort of a common theme that has emerged throughout uh, um, this project. Um, what we found was that um, across the country, jurisdictions are using different terminology to convey um, the combination of knowledge, skills, training that's required. Um, also, in terms of the, the topics, and you know, sort of looking at training, um, the topics that needed to be covered, and you can see that the, the bullet point at the bottom of the slide, um, the, the variation in terms of the number of jurisdictions that required these topics um, to be covered. Um, the last two gaps that uh, uh, two uh, gaps that Paul had um, shown were um, management and disposal of asbestos waste, and then asbestos and um, asbestos containing materials in the residential and commercial sector. So I'm just quickly going to touch on that. Um, in the context of uh, handling of asbestos waste, we identified three key issues. Um, one being um, multiple regulatory frameworks, um, creating some uh, significant challenges for uh, players, key players in this arena. Um, there are multiple stakeholders with multiple like, kind of different levels of responsibility um, in terms of, you know, along that spectrum, we've got contractors who are generating the waste, those who are collecting and transporting, those who are responsible for landfills. And what is interesting is that there are some of these regulations overlap, and then there's some that are distinct regulation, regulatory frameworks that apply to them. Um, one of the big issues that we saw in this area, and we heard from the key informant interviews, was the different definitions of what constitutes an asbestos-containing material. So in the uh, Occupational Health and Safety Framework, I mentioned it ranged from 0.1 to 1%. In the environment um, regulations, we see that it's at 1%. And that creates some issues in jurisdictions where if you've got it uh, defined as 0.1% in the workplace and it's 1% at the landfill, then so often what's being taken from the workplace to the landfill is not being treated as asbestos at the landfill, which means the landfill workers are now exposed. In terms of what we learned about the and heard of, um, from our key informants about um, asbestos in the residential and commercial sectors, and as Paul noted, um, you know, in terms of where we are seeing um, uh, still seeing very high prevalence of exposure, it's in this sector, and um, this was identified as a critical challenge by the key informants. Um, and what we found was that there's no jurisdiction in this country. Um, that has generally applicable requirements for asbestos inventories and risk assessments to be performed in residential buildings. So that's creating some significant gaps um, in terms of how permits are issued, reg registration of contractors, um, the requirement to hire competent workers. Um, we also heard from um, regulators that they, this pre has created some pretty significant challenges for enforcement. Um, there are some... Um, we're, we also heard a lot about the prevalence, a very high prevalence of what people were referring to as fly-by-night contractors. So people that are, are not um, properly training their workers, they're not hiring trained workers, and they're kind of flying under the radar. And that in general, there's an ignorance about kind of the regulations and the requirement to protect workers. So before I share with you the conclusions, um, based on what you've heard, uh, this is our final poll. Uh, do you think the national uh, asbestos management standard is needed in Canada? Great, thank you. So we see that most of you think that yes, there is a need. 
and uh, you are in alignment with what we heard from all our key informants, there is definitely an appetite in this country for uh, a national standard. Um, so what we recommended based on all the information that we had collected through those environmental scans internationally, as well as across Canada, the lit reviews um, and the key informant interviews was that uh, the CSA group should create a national asbestos management standard um, and with the main goal being to address those inconsistencies that we just highlighted. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the, the big reasons that was identified by the key informants was that this is a, a standardization is absolutely needed to establish those minimum competency levels um, and that the creation of a standard would support regulators in their efforts to enforce compliance. Um, we didn't hear any anything kind of a consistent or an overwhelming uh, recommendation around whether it should be a single standard or a suite of standards. And what we mean by a suite of standards is that it could be multiple standards or substandards under an umbrella of an asbestos standard. Um, we did hear from the key informants that priority should be given to creating standards on hazard identification and risk assessment, as well as training and competency. And we also did a quick scan to see um, what other organizations had created standards, and we um, flagged those for the CSA group, um, noting that their they have standards, the ISO has standards, and ASTM has standards, all of which could be used as starting points, so they don't have to start from ground zero. And then just to give you a sense of where we're at with this process, um, I am working with the CSA group, we're about to work again with the CSA group to undertake a follow-up study with the key informants um, to clarify scope, and we're anticipating that that will take a couple of months. Um, and then the next step for the CSA group is once um, they have the input from that study is that they'll go through a process of identifying and securing funding um, from uh, partners across the country um, that could be anywhere from six to 12 months. And then once that's in place, they'll issue a notice of intent to develop the standard and then they'll issue a call for participation. Um, so I was advised by my contact at the CSA group is that if anyone has any specific questions um, or comments about those next steps that they would welcome uh, you just reaching out. Um, and I've included the email address here. And then as Paul mentioned, we have also included the link to the report and CSA is uh, tracking um, uh, statistics around the number of times the report is downloaded. So we encourage you if you want a copy of it, please go to this link and download the report. And I think we've got a few minutes for questions for either myself or for Paul. Thank you very much, Anya.